Just so glad you've chosen to worship with us on this last Sabbath, just before Christmas. This is also our big day in supporting the new building. That's pretty exciting. We're gonna hear more about that in the service. But before that, we do have an announcement regarding the books where you've been exchanging. Yes, we have had such a great time seeing all the books that you have brought out to the foyer at the Uconnect table there in the back. We are going to be doing this two more Sabbaths, this Sabbath and next Sabbath. Remember, this is a book that has been a spiritual blessing to you. You bring one book, drop it off, and you can shop for another book that you can pick up. There have been some great ones from children's books to devotionals to all sorts of things. So come out, check out that table, bring a book and take one. And then this afternoon is our annual festival lessons in carols. It's always a wonderful program. We go through some of the famous Christmas carols. It's a special time. We encourage you to come out this afternoon at 430 right here in the sanctuary. On January the 4th, we have our special traditional communion service. Pastor Philip Milosavljevic will be sharing the message that morning, and we encourage you to come out. I know many of you will try to find something else to do that Sabbath, but this is a very meaningful and special communion service, and we encourage you to come and participate uh, in that with us. Well, that's our announcements for today. For more information, of course, go to the website, the bulletin, the app, and we're always happy to see you at the Uconnect Center in the foyer. Have a blessed Sabbath and a very Merry Christmas. We love you guys. of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be a 
exalted shall be exalted. Sabbath. We come this morning to praise our King of Kings and Lord of Lords because we know he reigns forever and ever. We are told in Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say it, rejoice as we collectively lift our praises this morning I just want to welcome you to the Loma Linda University Church. If you have joined us here in the sanctuary or on our broadcast, we are so excited that you are here to join us for our pre-Christmas Sabbath. We also welcome the orchestra and the choir. It's wonderful to have them here. We continue our five-part series with Pastor Randy this morning, and our focus will be on peace. I'd like to invite Pastor Randy to come on up. He is going to be introducing somebody to us. Thank you very much, Pastor Shauna. I bring with me Linda Mendez, who's no stranger to our congregation. Linda has been working with our outreach ministry, You Reach, now for a significant period of time. She's been involved with Excel, has been involved with the cafe, and has done some wonderful things here in our ministry. It's my privilege to introduce Linda officially today as our new director for UReach, as our new outreach director. So, Linda, welcome into this new role. We're delighted for you. And I want to ask you, 
You know the lay of the land. You've been involved in it now for some years, some time. What excites you about stepping into this role? Well, my family and I have been part of this community for going about five years. And I've gotten the chance to get to know some of you and to work in outreach. And I've seen how this church has a passion for outreach. And what I look forward to the most is getting to know more of you and seeing where we can take you reach with the help of all of you. There's a lot of areas of you reach that I think the church doesn't know that we do. And I'd love to be able to get you guys involved and share those with you. That's very exciting because our church is deeply interested in outreach into our community, making different, a difference here and now for those who need to know that God cares about them and loves them. So as Linda and I have been talking and planning and thinking about what's ahead, it's exciting and we'll be sharing that with you as the year begins. We'll be more and more deeply involved in outreach ministry. But for now, I hope you reach out to Linda today, extend your welcome to her, and your assurance that we are behind the outreach ministry of our church. Welcome and congratulations. Thank you. And now, as we enter our worship service, let us open up our hearts to honor the child who has come to redeem us, the one we call wonderful, counselor, mighty God, Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father. I, this is the Father that we worship and honor today in our praises. Happy Sabbath.
Let us bow our heads for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, what an awesome privilege it is to be in your presence and to call upon your holy and righteous name. Dear God, we're in the middle of the Christmas season, a time when there is much buying and selling, much gift giving and gift receiving, commercializing and merchandising. But dear God, help us to remember that you are truly the reason for the season. Oh God, that you are the greatest gift that was ever given to mankind. That you came as a babe in swaddling clothing, away in a manger, no crib for your bed. Oh, but in that precious gift was the gateway for salvation for all of humanity. And for this, we say thank you and hallelujah this morning. Oh, Father, many hearts are filled with joy today, but we would not forget those whose hearts are not so happy today, those who are ill, those who are in their hospital beds, those who are in rehab, those who are on hospice care, those who have lost a loved one and the season makes it difficult for them to remember that person not being with them during this time. Oh, Father, please be with all of them during this time, we pray. And the peace that you have given each of us in our hearts, let us be determined to find someone, to reach out to someone who may not have the joy in their hearts that we have and to offer them the peace and the grace that you have given us. This is our prayer. In the blessed name of Jesus, everyone said, Amen. Amen.
Several weeks ago, for our building highlight, we featured young adults. Last Sabbath, we had the senior adult community represented by our own Edna Mae Loveless. This week, I would like to introduce to you my friend from junior high, Master Riley Ice. Master I Riley Ice is 13, and he's also a junior high leader. So I'm very excited that you're here. How are you doing, Riley? I'm good. I'm good, Pastor Doug. Uh, how are you? I'm doing very good. Thank you very much. You know, now that we're here for the building highlight, uh, Riley, I'd like to ask you a question. It's very simple. On the pastoral staff, who's your favorite pastor? <laughs> My dad. <laughs> okay. I should have seen that coming. <laughs> I should have seen. He's a good man, and I, I love Pastor Roy, but... Uh, but of all the pastors, who's been really kind to you and kind of a, kind of a, a really good, a really good influence on you? Uh, Pastor Shauna and Pastor Joel. Oh. Yeah. Pastor Shauna, Pastor Joel. Yeah, they've they're very kind, and uh, they look after you. They probably gave you toys when you were young. Not really. <laughs> but now that you're <laughs> Riley. Look me in the eyes. Now that you're in the junior high realm and you're kind of uh, a leader in junior high, who has been kind of that, that maybe even a, an adult mentor, that influencer in your life as a junior high person? Oh, okay, yeah, I got it, okay. Pastor Adrian Presley. I see how it is, Riley. You've been talking to your dad again. Okay. In all seriousness, what do you think of the new building, Riley? I think it's amazing. We're kind of crowded right now, but we need a new room. It's true. It's time for a new room for junior high space. Friends, the, uh, the junior high community will be the youngest community that is served specially at this, uh, with this new building. However, it will serve our whole, as we tried to make clear, our whole church membership all generations will be served in this new building. But friends, today we've set aside as a special giving day, and today we receive a special offering to keep the building going. We have some heavy lifting ahead of us, and I know that you have been faithful. I would like to ask, before we have special prayer, I would like to ask the leaders of this church to come forward. I want to ask our senior pastor, our financial administrator, our board chair, our head elder to come forward and to have special prayer with us today. And I would like, Riley, would you be willing to have prayer for us this morning? Sure. Okay. Dear Jesus, please be with the special offering today. Thank you for my church that is building for the generations to come like mine. We pray for your special blessing as we build for your kingdom. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Little ladies and gentlemen, where are you out there this morning? It is time for that lamb's offering. Grown-ups, you can raise them up there. We find that uh, tens and twenties are, are more apt to be picked up. So hold up higher denominations, please. Kids, grab them all as you're coming down. We're going to sing away in a manger while you come on down. looking so carefully. Thank you so much for collecting that lamb's offering. Well, how many of you like to build with blocks, with Legos, with anything like that? Ah, I think I like to build too. In fact, when my little kiddos were kind of little, we had a little thing that we would do. I would build up a little tower and they would come and smash it down. Oh, some of you are laughing. Do any of you have little brothers or sisters who come and smash down the stuff that you build? Yeah. How many of you have smashed down stuff that other people have built? Yeah, 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 yeah. It happens. It happens. Hopefully we get a little older and we don't like to, you know, bust things down so much. Which is what I want to talk about this morning. Our hearts are kind of like that too. And when you talk with people and when you meet people and when you are interacting with people, you can help to build them up inside or you can make things more difficult for them and tear them down inside. That doesn't feel very good. We don't like to do that to other people. Pastor Randy is going to be talking about being peace builders today. Building peace and building people up and making people feel good that you have been around. I know sometimes it can be hard to remember these things, so, Today, we are going to give you all this little reminder that you can put on your wrist. It says, peace on earth. It reminds you that Jesus is the one who gives you peace in your heart and that you also should be peace builders wherever you go. All right? You can go back to your seat as you get these little bracelets on your way back. Thank you so much for listening.
Our scripture, th our scripture this morning is from Luke 6, 27 to 36, or on page 1,535 in your pew Bibles. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love the, those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be the children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Those of you who have been worshiping with us week to week during this Advent series, the sophisticated and classy art of regifting, know that we start each sermon with an appointment. I made an appointment last week. It was actually up on the wood, so we're going to do it down here today, with Sarah Oyen. I wonder if Sarah's here. Sarah here, and has she brought? Oh, there you are, Sarah. Have mercy. Can you get that? That's as big as you are, Sarah. Come right up. We're glad you're here. Thank you so much. Now, I'm really curious about that. Now, last week, you know what, Sarah? I'm going to sit down up here. That way you don't have to crane your neck so much. Is that okay? All right. So did you take the gift home last week? Yes. You did. Did you play with it? Yes. You did. What was the gift for those who weren't here? It was a hoverboard. A hoverboard. I'm sure everybody out there has a hoverboard. Now, you played with it. That means you wrote it? Yeah. You did. Were you successful at it? Mm-hmm. You know, somebody came up to me from our media department, my good brother Stu, and said we might even be able to see how you wrote it. So why don't we look up at the screen and see if somebody actually captured you writing this. Do we have that? I'm going. Hello, and today I'm going to show you how I spin on my hoverboard. Oh my goodness. Go over to an area, you might not be able to hear me, but anyway. <laughs> Look at that, Sarah. Okay. Wow. That is amazing. Wow. You know, watching that. If I had a hoverboard, that's exactly how I would not be riding it. That's amazing. Well, so you had a good time with it, but you agreed to bring something back, either that gift or another gift. I see you brought something back, right? Yes. All right. So we're going to invite someone else to come up this morning, and that's Ethan Castillo. Ethan Castillo, where are you? There you are. Come right on up here, Ethan. It's good to see you this morning. Welcome. Do you like getting up in front of people? You don't. Do you like being up here with something like that up here? Kind of. <laughs> Very good, Ethan. So this is the Christmas time of year, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, I was looking kind of eye to eye with Sarah. Now I'm looking up to you. <laughs> so tell me about this concept of re-gifting. What is that all about? Um, you give someone something that you've been given. That's very good. Is it usually something you want or something you don't want? Something you don't want. Oh. <laughs> I think you've got it down pretty good. But you know, Sarah, I think, brought something here today that she wants to re-gift to you. Now, I don't know what's in there. I haven't asked her, so I'm not sure what's there. But Sarah, can you bring it over here a little bit further? And let's see. Uh, so, Ethan, let's take the paper out of that. All right, Sarah, can you help them holding this paper? There's a lot of paper here. All right. We're di oh, wow. We're digging down in there. Look at that. There's more. I don't, I don't think there's anything in here except paper. All right. There's a little more paper. Got to get the rest of that paper out. All right. Now, what? Oh, my goodness. 
Did you mean that for Ethan or for your pastor? <laughs> Ethan, why don't you take that out? Look at that. Have mercy. That says an Apple iPad Air. Wow. That's pretty nice, isn't it? You can hover all over the place on that. <laughs> Well, that's beautiful, Sarah. Thank you so much. That's a wonderful re-gift. And I know that Ethan really appreciates that. Now, Ethan, remember what re-gifting is? What is re-gifting again? To give something that you've been given. Ah, to give something that you've been given. So I'm going to make an appointment with you, okay? So next Sabbath, right here, we're going to meet again. Is that good with you? Mm -hmm. And you can bring this, give it to your pastor, or you can bring something else. It's up to you what you bring, and there will be somebody who's standing over here where Sarah is that you will give them to her. Is that a deal? Yes. All right, well, you can put that back in here, and Sarah, you can put that paper back on it. And I'm going to hand you, Sarah, thank you so much, yes, a gift that we want to give you to take home and enjoy this Christmas season. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you very much, Ethan. And we'll see you, Ethan, next week. Thank you. <laughs> wow, I know what I'm thinking. Who's the last child in this line? Can I get in that line? <laughs> Wonderful. Regifting. 2,000 years ago, above the plains and the hills of Bethlehem, the angel choir sang, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Peace. And yet everywhere I look these days, it seems, we have strife and conflict and angry people. I don't know if it's the same in your world. That certainly describes the world that I see. For example, we could start with the big picture. We could click on a website called war, warsintheworld.com, and looking down through their list, we would discover that they say that 69 nations are involved in wars right now while we worship in peace. Peace? Or we could maybe make it a bit more narrow. And we could say, well, what about the United States? Now, in this one, it depends just a bit which source you look at. But one of the sources says we're engaged right now in seven wars in some fashion. Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace on whom his favor rests. So exactly on whom does his favor rest? Certainly not on Republicans and Democrats. And I'm not even talking about the big picture. I'm talking about the individual people like you and me. Pew Research Center says, according to their studies, 64% of Democrats and 55% of Republicans, just ordinary people like us, have almost none or zero friends across the aisle. Just ordinary people. Why? Because there's no peace. The angel said, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. On whom does his favor rest then? Certainly not on your neighbor, right? Your neighbor with whom you've had all that back and forth, all that go around, all those challenges, all that difficulty. You say, my peace, the peace of God doesn't rest on my neighbor. The song wafts across the centuries to us. Glory to God in the highest heaven. And on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. So on whom does it rest? Well, the answer is very simple. It rests on you. Jesus came to declare God's peace to you, to me. He came, in the words of Paul in Ephesians, to declare peace to those who were nearby and peace to those who were far away. That includes you and me. God's favor rests on us. The message of peace with God, the message of peace with others, that's the gift we've been given. 
So now the question, what will we do with that peace? I want to take you to a passage of Scripture in Luke's Gospel, chapter 6. It's the passage that Isabella and Michaela read just a few moments ago. They read it from today's New International Version, which is our Pew Bible. So I'm going to read it today from a paraphrase, from the message by Eugene Peterson. I don't usually read the entire text from a paraphrase, but today I'm going to do that. But before reading, I want to give a bit of context. Because the passage we will read today occurs in a sermon that Jesus preached. He may have preached it on more than one occasion, depending on how you read the text. Both Matthew and Luke record the sermon, but there are some differences. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus climbed a hill, sat down, and taught his disciples. In Luke's gospel, Jesus descended from a hill, stood up, and taught the crowd. So there's some differences. We call, in Matthew's gospel, we call it the Sermon on the Mount. In Luke's gospel, we call it the Sermon on the Plain. Matthew's is very spiritual in nature. For example, Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Luke's is very earthy. Jesus just said, blessed are the poor. There are similarities and there are differences. But each of the two tellings of a sermon that may have been preached more than once includes a critical passage, and it's the passage we're going to read today. Now, I'm going to tell you right up front, the word peace does not appear in the passage. And yet, as you read the passage, you realize peace is woven all through the structure of this. Peace permeates the passage. Peterson in the message divides it up into three paragraphs. So we'll read those paragraphs one at a time. Luke 6, verse 27 begins paragraph number one. If I were giving names to these paragraphs, I would give the name love generously to this paragraph. Love generously. So here goes Luke 6, 27. Jesus speaking, To you who are ready for the truth, I say this, love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the energies of prayer for that person. If someone slaps you in the face, stand there and take it. If someone grabs your shirt, gift wrap your best coat and make a present of it. If someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice the servant life. No more tit for tat stuff. Live generously. Love generously. That's what Jesus is talking about in this passage. He calls us to a very high standard. Now, you have to understand the kind of love. This is not the kind of love that is eros, the Greek word that is the love of attraction, sexual attraction. This is not the love that is philos, the love of brotherly friendship. This is the agape kind of love. Not good feelings, but good actions a choice in the best interest of the other person. And Jesus says, love your enemies. That's new. The Old Testament says, love your neighbor. But the Old Testament is filled with prayers of vengeance on one's enemies. And Jesus comes along and says, love them. Now, it's not that he means love just your enemies. He's just pushing it to the extreme. After all, G.K. Chesterton once said, the Bible tells us to love our neighbors and to love our enemies because usually they're the same people. So it covers the waterfront. Love everyone in your life, including those who mistreat you. Now, if you take that seriously, you begin to realize, if I lived that way, I would be sowing peace wherever I went. That's not usually what peace looks like to most of us. Michael Ramsden, a Christian apologist, tells the experience of speaking to a crowd of people and speaking to them about peace. And he asked them if they would do him a favor. He said, would you all close your eyes right now, and I want you to bring up in your mind's eye a scene of peace. What does peace look like to you? And so he let them close their eyes, and he waited a couple of minutes giving them ample time to think it through. 
When they opened their eyes, they began to hear from the group. What did you see? One person said, I saw a beautiful mountain meadow set against an alpine scene. Another person said, I saw fields of flowers and trees gently caressed by the breeze. Another said, no, I saw a beautiful lake, placid and clean. To which Ramsden pointed out, he said, isn't it curious that when I ask you to picture peace, the first thing every one of you did was to get rid of all the other people. Get rid of them. I don't want them here because they cause trouble. That's peace to us. Jesus will have none of that. He says, love even your enemies. If we live that way, we sow peace. We become peacemakers. Second paragraph. If the title of the first paragraph is Love Generously, the title of the second paragraph is Don't Reciprocate in Kind. Don't Reciprocate in Kind. Back to Luke 6. Here's a simple rule of thumb for behavior, says Jesus. Ask yourself what you want people to do for you, then grab the initiative and do it for them. If you only love the lovable, do you expect a pat on the back? Run-of-the-mill sinners do that. If you only help those who help you, do you expect a medal? Garden variety sinners do that. If you only give for what you hope to get out of it, do you think that's charity? The stingiest of pawnbrokers does that. Jesus is saying, don't reciprocate in kind. That's our temptation. To wait to see what the other person does, and then we respond, often striking back in anger, and peace flees out the front door. Jesus says, no, no, no. I want you to think about how you would wish for them to treat you, and then you do that for them. Jesus was not the first one to come up with a concept like this. There are numerous different people in the ancient world before Jesus who said similar things. But in virtually every case... They put a negative spin on it. What you don't want them doing to you, don't you do to them. How many parents have said that? But if you think about it, that's a much easier directive to follow. If you don't want them hitting you, don't hit them. If you don't want somebody taking your life, don't take their life. Jesus takes it a big step further. He not only says, resist doing something bad to them if you wouldn't want it done to you. He puts it in the positive, and he says, actually, whatever you would like for them to do for you, you do it for them. Don't reciprocate in kind. What a message for us in today's world, in today's climate, and environment. The comedian and improv actor Patton Oswalt is very used to that kind of exchange. Gets heckled from the audience, gets people tweeting him things that are nasty and ugly, and he's used to responding in kind and, and then some. Very much so. They give it to me, I'm going to give it back to them. Except on that one occasion. Seems that Oswald had tweeted out something on his Twitter, Twitter account, had tweeted out something very harsh and negative about President Trump. Well, there was a Trump supporter out there by the name of Michael Beatty. And Michael Beatty, when he read what had been written, he came back with force and gusto, trying to even the score. And you know what happens, you know how these things work. You reciprocate in kind. You do it and just ratchet it up, and pretty soon people are yelling through the Twitter sphere at each other. But something different happened this time. This time, Oswald, I want to read you his response, what he tweeted out to what Beatty had said. Oswald tweeted out, oh, man, this dude just attacked me on Twitter. And I joked back, but then I looked at his timeline And he's in a lot, all caps, 
He's in a lot of trouble health-wise. He's been dealt some terrible cards. Let's deal him some good ones. Click and donate just like I'm about to. And there was a link to a GoFundMe account that Oswald had set up for Beatty. And it set a goal of $5,000 to help with Beatty's health care costs. Well, people responded. They l- l- clicked on it, and they gave, until by the time it came to a conclusion, Beatty had received almost ten times what the goal had been. Now, you can imagine how that would affect you. So now I want you to listen to Beatty's quote. As he tweeted back to Oswald, he said, You have humbled me to the point where I can barely compose my words. You have caused me to take pause and reflect on how harmful words from my mouth could result in such an outpouring. Can I state Beatty's words again in my own language? Beatty, at looking what had happened, said, I am stunned. I'm overwhelmed. How could there be such an outpouring of grace and generosity to the actions and the words of such anger? How could that be? But the fact that it has happened has me re-examining everything I say. Can you imagine? In the midst of a turbulent, strident, angry society, if a body of people called the church said, we will not reciprocate in kind. That's not what we're going to do. We're going to take Jesus at his word. And when he says, do to them as you might wish they would do to you, that's what we're going to do. Do you know what would happen? We would be sowing peace in the furrows of hate. We would be sowing generosity in the presence of stinginess, grace in the presence of animosity. We would be peacemakers. He's given us his peace. The question is, what will we do with it? So the first paragraph, love generously. Second paragraph, don't respond in kind. And the last paragraph, third paragraph, re-gift the way God gifts. Re-gift the way God gifts. In other words, in the way that God gives, with the attitude, with the spirit, with the heart, re-gift in the same way. Listen to the third paragraph. I tell you, says Jesus, love your enemies, help and give without expecting in return. You'll never, I promise, regret it. Live out this God-created identity the way our Father lives toward us, generously and graciously, even when we're at our worst. Our Father is kind. You be kind. Regift the way God gifts. So we have to ask, just how does God gift? When he gives his gift, how does he approach it? This book is replete with passages that answer that question. I'll give you just one in Romans 5. I remember my father often quoting this verse. But God commends his love. God shows his love to us. In that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the way God gives When we least deserve it, he pours out his gift on us. Regift the way God gifts. So what might that look like? In our world, in our society, in our culture that is riven by strife, what might that look like? Well, last year, there was a political race going in the, in the state of Vermont. It was a state seat that was available. 
And yet, despite the fact that it was more local, the two candidates, the Republican, Zach Mayo, and the Democrat, Lucy Rogers, they were intent on winning that race. So intent on winning that race that each of them decided and made a commitment to knock on the door of every single household in their district. They would both pound the pavement with their message. They would each, according to them, I'm going to win, say, I'm going to win this. They were deeply committed to it. Now, you know how local politics can get. As nasty as national are, sometimes local is even more nasty and more personal. But they made a commitment. Zach Mayo, Republican, Lucy Rogers, Democrat, they made a commitment. We're going to keep this clean. We're going to do it in a dignified manner. But they differed on virtually every topic and every theme. The debate came. A lot of people turned out. They were interested in what was happening locally. They knew the differences. They knew the commitment. Their doors had been knocked on. They wanted to see what would happen. The debate came. And they debated. They debated the issues. But then when they came to the end of the debate, Zach Mayo took out a guitar Lucy Rogers took out a cello, and together they serenaded the crowd. The people were stunned. In fact, I want to read you the comments of three or four people who were there that day. Attendees to the debate said things like this. It was very sweet and kind, and it just drew you into a different place. Another, it marked a turning point for, others, for us. Another, it gave me a lot of hope. Alas, it was what we really needed, what we have needed all along. And then the local newscaster, telling the story across the airwaves, closed the story by saying this. Their song so deeply resonated in northern Vermont that there are actually houses with signs for both candidates. <laughs> it's a clear indication that the winner of this race has already been decided. It's a landslide victory for civility. What a concept. People being civil to each other. Not reciprocating in kind. Treating the other the way they would wish to be treated. And it comes straight out of the words of Jesus. Re-gift in the way God gives. With the grace that he has poured out on you, approach others. He doesn't say it in this passage, but I would be hard-pressed to find a passage that more clearly says, in this way you will sow peace. So the song continues to waft across the centuries to us. Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace to those on whom His favor rests. On whom does it rest? It rests on you and on me. It's not whether or not we have it. It's what we'll do with it. So I encourage you, this week, with your neighbors, with that person across on the other side of the aisle, with those who might be classified as enemies, through your kind and generous acts, re-gift the peace God has given you.
Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace to you on whom his favor rests. And now may the love of the Father, the grace of the Son, and the power of the Spirit guide you in peacemaking in the world this week. Amen. I invite you to be seated for the postlude. Oh, oh. 